My name is Lauren Moore, and I'm very proud to be one of the leaders of the Center for Health Worker Innovation at Johnson & Johnson. I just want to officially welcome you all here tonight. We couldn't be more pleased to be hosting another session of hearing the voices and stories of our frontline health workers and nurses. We've done this uh, type of event on a number of occasions, and every time we say, gosh, should we sort of rethink the model, we have so much incredible positive feedback on this very conversation, because I think we all recognize that keeping the voices of health workers front and center in all of our conversations is so, so critical. I think it's also important as we sort of hear from our speakers tonight and, and sharing their stories that the importance of community-based care if we want to achieve UHC and have access to primary care, how critical, how critical community-based care is. And I think again, sort of keeping health workers at the center of the conversation we like, at Johnson & Johnson, we like to say, if we can solve the challenges facing frontline health workers and nurses, we improve health for everyone. And I think the idea that we focus, we hear their voices. I'm happy to say that in all of the UNGA conversations that I've attended so far, it's only two days, but it feels like a week, um, <laughs> that health workers were in every conversation that I was part of. So I think our ability to listen to their stories, keep them integrated in the work, understand that they have the hard job and they know more than we do about what those needs are and what can move things forward, I just think is critically important. So tonight we are going to hear from four health workers and nurses. We're so, I think that we're so pleased to have them here. I will encourage all of them to please try not to be nervous. I know it's a little scary to get here with the microphone, but we are all here to support you and just so looking forward to hearing from you. So thank you very much for being here. And I have a thank you. I'm going to use my notes so I don't forget every, anyone. Um, a number of partners who helped us make this event possible and we're so appreciative. The Community Health Impact Coalition. And not only do I say she or chick. She, not a she, but a chick. So she, thank you so much. Mothers to Mothers, the International Council of Nurses, the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, and the University of North Carolina Institute for Global Health and Infectious Disease. Thank you all so much for your help putting this, putting this all together. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Madeline Ballard, who is the CEO of Community Health Impact Coalition, or SHEIC, a network of community health workers and health organizations working in more than 60 countries to make professional community health workers the norm worldwide. Madeline will not rest until there is health for all and neither should any of us. Madeline? Good evening, everyone. So I think as anyone uh, who's been in this space for a while knows, uh, for too long, Conversations about healthcare workers have been happening without healthcare workers. And uh, as we know, if you're not around the table, that usually means you're on the menu, right? <laughs> um, so uh, it's time for a change, and I think we're beginning to see that change due to the efforts of so many uh, in this room. And um, it's a good thing because there's a reason that so many of the most powerful movements in history have adopted the ethos nothing about us without us. And it's because those best places to effect change are those closest to the problem. And when we still live in a world where a billion people are gonna go their entire lives without ever seeing a healthcare worker, we have a problem. When we live in a world where half of community health workers in low middle income countries are on salary, we have a problem. And when we live in a world where 70% of frontline healthcare workers are women, that they only make up 25% of the leadership roles, we have a problem. <laughs> Give applause our um, So this week, as uh, heads of state gather to continue to debate universal health coverage, tonight we are here to celebrate and build the power of those who are actually working every day to achieve it, which is healthcare workers. So, a round of applause. 
I uh, am very honored uh, tonight to get to introduce uh, four incredible workers who are here to um, win better care for their communities. We're going to hear from each of them in turn. We'll conclude the evening with a Q&A, so please do note your queries as we go. And uh, to kick us off, I'm so pleased to introduce Irma Nolasco, who is a promotora, or a community health worker, uh, who is actually working in JJ's backyard, just across the river in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And uh, she'll kick us off.
I was excited to think that there was something good that I could give my community. Being a community helicopter, I bring information and I teach my community. And I, I advise them and encourage them just like a teacher does. El Team Salud nos enseña talleres sobre salud y de cómo hacer el alcance en la comunidad y dónde poner el flyer donde llevamos esa información a las personas y cómo hablar de acercarse a que tomen conciencia de su salud y motivarlos para que ellos tomen esa importancia de que tienen que cuidar a sus familias. A Team Salud we offer a worship on health and how to do outreach in the community from where to put a flyer, how to approach people, and to motivate them to take control of their health and that of their families. He aprendido que nuestro trabajo como promotora es conectar a nuestra comunidad y a los servicios de salud. Este trabajo también es como ser una maestra. Somos parte de las nuestras comunidades y conocemos cuáles son los I have learned that our job as community health ambassadors is to connect our community with the health services. And this job is just like being a teacher. We are part of our community. We know the challenges that we are facing when we seek this uh, type of medical service. No hablamos el idioma, trabajamos muchas horas, no podemos donde buscar los recursos, no tenemos que nos piden a nuestros niños y, y no podemos ir a un examen médico por ese motivo y tenemos miedo de participar porque somos indocumentados. Now, we do not speak the language. We work long hours. We do not know where to look for the service. Now, we have been able to manage to make people trust us. They know us. They see us actively carrying out information while we walk the street. Durante la pandemia del COVID-19, vimos a nuestra comunidad asustada, sin información y en situaciones de alto riesgo. Comenzamos a llamar a nuestra gente para informarla y compartir la información verídica directo de fuentes médicas. Llevamos esta información a las bodegas, a los negocios locales. Compartimos esta información en las redes sociales, todo en inglés y en español. Trabajamos duro para que la, nuestra comunidad, nuestra gente, creyeran esta información y que ellos mismos se hicieran la prueba y los ayudamos a que se inscribieran para las vacunas de COVID y de flu. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw our community scared. They were with no information and in high risk situation. We began calling our people, sharing with them information that was truthful, that came from uh, sources that were medical. We take this information to stores, to small businesses, and we share this information in social media. We do it in Spanish, we do it in English. We work hard so that our community would trust this information to go and get tested. And we help them sign up for COVID and flu vaccine. say that being a community health ambassador has become my life project and also my dream. 
I am happy to help people in one way or another. I help people every day. I receive information and I pass it on to my community. And not only that, but I am able to take this information for myself, take care of me and my family. We are one voice creating a culture of healthcare. explain to her husband that she's going to need surgery. He was terrified. Understandably so, but he was terrified at the idea of her having surgery in the longer in Malawi. After back and forth, I convinced him that uh, this is what I do and uh, that he should uh, consent for the surgery. And he did. We took her to the operating room. Uh, we opened her abdomen. Uh, we evacuated her the blood and we removed her spleen. And uh, she subsequently did well and went home. Unfortunately, uh, surgeons are not available to treat the majority of Malawians. And this American couple expected top notch care in Malawi. They were lucky because they came to the right place at the right time to a place that so happened to have a surgeon present. So the question I pose to you is, shouldn't all Malawis have access to surgical care? Yes. I first started going to Malawi in 2008. Uh, when I arrived in the long way Malawi at Kilimanjaro Central Hospital, uh, there was only one surgeon in this 1,000 bed hospital. His name was Arturo Nilko, and he was 84. And he worked hard. I was only there for about three weeks. And during that period of time, I knew this was not sustainable. And so he told me, he said, you know, there are lots of visitors that come here and go back to England and go back to America. But what I really need is for you to start a training program to train Malawi medical students graduating as physicians to become surgeons. And so when I came back to the States, I thought about it. And it kind of just haunted me. And I thought, well, this is what I need to do. And so with other partners, we decided to start a general surgery residency training program, an orthopedic surgery residency training program for Malawians in Malawi. The, the, 
surgery density in the United States is 70 surgeons for one million people. In Malawi, it's one surgeon for one million people. And so we know that we have an uphill task in order to get this done. But we've been doing this now for the past 15 years. I'm watching a medical student go from a novice to a fully trained surgeon as a source of pride and enormous joy for me personally. I'm watching them go to become leaders within their communities, within their hospitals, within the healthcare system, so that Malawians can lead and train the next generation of Malawian surgeons. As I reflect back on what actually Rico said to me, helping train surgeons, it has become evident that if you do not train Malawians to become their own surgeons, nobody else on the outside is going to come and do it. And that's what we did. And the Malawians that we've trained have all stayed in the country. They've now become leaders within the field. They've transformed not only their own personal lives, they transformed the lives of others around them. They're now training the next generation of future surgeons in Malawi. They've all stayed in the country. And we believe that uh, our model can be a model that is sustainable, that can be copied all across countries in Sub Saharan Africa. So the future of the African child. Exploring care from the street, the living room, all the way to the surgical bed, and we need all levels of care, uh, and we're proud to celebrate all forms of caregiving this evening. Uh, our next speaker is uh, my sister, Bupe Sankala, a community healthcare worker, a uh, mentor mother, uh, and an advocate from Zambia. Um, who not only provides care, but uh, organizes others to uh, make sure that community health figures get what they need to do so. Good evening, everyone. Um, my aunt once told me, when life gets tough, you have two choices. To give up and accept defeat, or to rise up and fight. Those were the words that resonated with the cold light of the white room at the health clinic when our pedigree was old, where the equally cold words from the doctor cut through me like a knife, hearing me say you are HIV positive. It felt like the end of my world. I was so scared, and my husband promised he would be by my side, but he did leave. I felt so alone. On a lighter note, my name is Bope Senkala, as I have been introduced, and I am a community health worker for African NGO Mothers to Mothers in Zambia. It is often said it is darkest before the dawn, and that speaks so much to me, because my story is one of strength and hope. Strength against all odds, and hope in the darkest of times. Now this strength came from a number of places. First, it was through my family. When, no, when uh, people um, turned their backs on me, my family was there to support me. When I was so scared of having disappointed them, they reassured me. And when people didn't want to have any physical contact with me because of the deep stigma that still exists against people that are living with HIV, my family was there to help me because people would say, uh, you can't touch me or use the same cutlery as me because you give me HIV. But my family was there to help me. And that made me stronger. And thinking of my aunt, I chose to fight. And that helped me to be where I am now. Because in Zambia, where I come from, if you do not have a supportive family, it is very difficult to um, take your medication, to disclose your status, and also to follow up on your clinic visits. That is why um, it is so key that I and Anna aim to a mentor mothers um, come from the very same community because we understand our clients better. <laughs> um, so uh, the other place um, my strength came from is through the power of caring. Uh, I became a community health worker because I wanted to share um, that support that I had been given to others. 
and also caring for myself because it is so easy for one to neglect their physical and mental health. And um, I also care for others, ensuring that my peers get all the information that they need um, in one place, just like we do as Mothers to Mothers, where we offer services from HIV, um, malaria, tuberculosis, diabetes, um, um, cervical cancer, so that they can make the healthiest decisions for themselves. Uh, because um, health does not exist in a vacuum. It depends on so many things um, in life. And um, to have someone who truly understands what it's like in your shoes is to have a new vision of hope. I know this. I know this because that is how I felt when I first came across um, Princess Kasule. I'm sure you've heard about her. She is an HIV activist and the first member of the Zambian parliament to openly share her status. Um, yes, and she, she is strong and she isn't ashamed. And she also made me see that there is life after an HIV diagnosis. And I'm, I'm, I'm also healthy because of the work that I do. I am able to speak like this. You know, because my work has taught me um, to speak to women, educate them, and be confident with them, and also be able to stand in front of a crowd like this in New York. <laughs> Minus 60 degrees Celsius wind, I pull my scarf up a little higher, although my nostrils are already burning, and tears have frozen to my eyelashes in what we call Arctic mascara. <laughs> but when I look up into the deep, dark, polar night, I see vibrant swaths of green with hints of pink dancing across the sky. The Inuit call it Aksarit, the aurora borealis, or northern lights. And they're believed to be the spirits of the ancestors guiding those on Earth in their journey. The hum of the snow machine approaches this community health center. An older gentleman pops off, and together we help a young pregnant woman into the health center. The young woman, who I'll call Melina, is 31 weeks pregnant and is visibly upset. She pushes back the hood of her amalti, or parka, revealing the sleeping face of her toddler tucked in the pouch on her back. Her eyes are red and swollen. She's been crying. She tells me she had an epic blow up with her boyfriend about his addiction, and he stormed off. <laughs> Melina knows that I know her, and that I'm not just another temporary nurse flown in from the south. She knows me, I know her. I know that her younger brother died by suicide just six weeks ago, and that her parents are not coping well with his loss. 
I know that her elderly grandmother, who sleeps in the living room of the house, has a chronic cough that probably keeps the overcrowded house of 13 people awake at night. Melina knows that I know of her community. She can trust me. Nunavut, which means our land in Inuktitut, the language of the indigenous Inuit people, is the northernmost territory in Canada. A remote frozen expanse over two million square kilometers, stretching across three time zones, Nunavut has a population of about 40,000 people living in 25 fly-in only communities above the Arctic Circle. I take pride in supporting this community the community's health from preconception to end of life and all points in between. While doctors and nurse practitioners do fly in on occasion and provide phone or virtual support from hundreds of kilometers away, with the support of the community health workers, clerk interpreters, and other allied health providers, we nurses are the ones that provide the primary health care in this community. Handling everything from episodic illness, to emergencies and resuscitations, prenatal care, immunizations, well baby checkups, mental health interventions, addiction support, chronic disease management, cancer screening, palliative care, and even occasionally looking after a sled dog. <laughs> and through our work, we keep in mind the Inuit societal values and the profound legacy of abuse stemming from indigenous residential schools and other systems of colonization. Saying the words truth and reconciliation is easy. Matching it with actions is what matters. But there's more to the story. After assessing Melina and her unborn child, I sit and I listen to her distress. She looks up, sighs deeply, and a small smile breaks through her tears. Often, it's not just the medical interventions that matter. Right now, she needs somebody that she can trust to listen to her and be there for her. She knows that I'm part of her community. She sees me at the grocery store or attending community feasts. I take pride in being a trusted component of this community that I serve. But I can't be everywhere all the time. The reality is that we're facing a global nursing shortage unlike any we have ever experienced. And this is most acutely felt in the most remote regions like Nunavut, where every week we're working hard and trying to avert the full closures of health centers because of the nursing shortage. As I try to do my part, I am utterly exhausted. In this busy health center, we should be staffed with seven or eight nurses but there's only three of us, including the supervisor. And I've been awake for over 24 hours. We're expected to provide more and more care in a shorter amount of time, reducing the ability to connect with our patients on a holistic level. Today, nurses aren't just leaving stressful workplaces, they're leaving the nursing profession altogether. And this just makes the problem even worse. The demand for care is ever increasing, and we need more nurses to share the workload. But there simply aren't enough nurses. And those of us who are left, we're burning out. It's a vicious cycle. So this is our call to action. Where you live should not determine whether you live. And this stark reality is even more evident for the remote communities, especially Nunavut and the Inuit. Governments need to invest not only in the recruitment of new nurses, but especially safeguard the retention of those experienced nurses who know their communities and can provide mentorship. And so I say, my presence means that patients won't see a constant revolving door of unfamiliar faces who know nothing about their communities, unique struggles and beauty. Melina pulls the hood of her mouth over her and her voice. They are all survivors, and she rubs her restless belly. And like the dancing excarnet in the night sky above, guiding travelers with their light, my presence reassures Melina 
that she's not alone. I continue to be in awe of indigenous resilience, and especially in women like Maria. It's my privilege to witness her kids grow up. It's my honor to be invited to be a part of their community, just as it is every nurse's honor to be right there where the people are. Queen, thank you.